Well, good afternoon. Hi, I'm Craig Head with the Nebraska Farm Bureau. Thank you for joining us today and watching our video. Today we're going to talk a little bit about some changes related to the Paycheck Protection Program. That's a program that many farmers and ranchers are very interested in as part of the federal COVID assistance. And to help do us to that today or help to do that today, we have with us Nebraska Farm Bureau's president, Mark McCard. Mark, thanks for being here. Thank you. Privilege to be here. You bet. And we also today with us, we have Jordan Dooks, who is our Director of National Affairs for Nebraska Farm Bureau. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks a lot, Craig. You bet. And our special guest today is Tina Barrett, who is the Executive Director of the Nebraska Farm Business, Inc. Tina has been a great partner with Nebraska Farm Bureau as we've gone through COVID and worked through a lot of these federal programs that impact farmers and ranchers. So, Tina, thank you for being here today. We appreciate yeah, you. Thank you. All right. Right now, Mark, a few things that you'd like to share with the, the folks watching the video. Yeah, I mean, you know, the mission for Nebraska Farm Bureau is to uh, achieve a great quality of life and prosperity for Nebraska farm and ranch families. And so uh, when we think about COVID, the disruptions of that, uh, obviously our federal government has, has known that it's a big disruption too. And so they provided a number of programs. And so uh, today I'm excited to just visit about just, just some more of that. So our members in, in Nebraska, uh, gets a good sense of if they can participate and uh, we're always big about bringing in those that really know know the issue and uh, uh, happy that Tina's here to answer all the difficult questions. <laughs> Thanks Mark. Yeah, it's always good to have Tina here, right? <laughs> so Tina, before we jump in and, and start kind of peppering you with the questions, maybe for those folks who are not familiar with, with Nebraska Farm Business Inc., do you mind just providing a little bit of background? Sure. So um, Nebraska Farm Business was started as part of Cooperative Extension actually back in the mid 70s. And then in the early 2000s, uh, through some budget cuts, we left the university and, and had a private company to do the same kind of work. But what we do is um, um, work with Nebraska farmers all across the state and ranchers um, doing tax returns, uh, financial analysis, accounting work, um, a lot of that stuff. Um, and so we pretty much only work with producers, uh, with farmers. And so um, we get to know the farm laws um, as closely as we can, even though they keep changing and, and uh, making it harder for us to, to do that all the time. So Tina, maybe we'll start off for those people who are not maybe familiar with the PPP program, Small Business Administration, maybe just a little bit of background. You might start in there and we'll start at the beginning here, just a little bit of background, what that program's for eligible. Yeah. Yeah, sure. My my 15 year old daughter would say that then you have not had supper at our table in the last 10 months because she has implemented a rule that we are not allowed to discuss PPP um, at all at supper anymore. It, we don't follow it, but she thinks she, that's a good rule. So the PPP um, program uh, started with the CARES Act back in March um, that they passed the, the first, that uh, was like the third um, stimulus package, but the first really big one. Um, and so what it does is allows you to go and get a loan through your local bank. Um, that includes the farm credit systems, which um, is different from most SBA programs, which eliminated a lot of those lenders. Um, and you went and got a loan based off of two and a half months of your average payroll for 2019. And then if you spent the money correctly and, and continued to keep your employees um, around, then they would come in and forgive that loan. So. Uh, we went through months of knowing, unknowing, or not knowing exactly how that was going to be treated tax-wise. We've gotten some clarification, but the basis of the program is that you take a loan, spend the money on, on employees and some other expenses that are qualified, and they'll forgive that loan. Okay. Well, just here at the end of the year, some changes to PPP, and it vastly expanded, I would think, in terms of some of the eligibility opportunities for farmers and ranchers to participate. Maybe let's start there uh, okay. for first time drawers, maybe what who's now eligible that might not have been able to participate before. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so the first round closed back in August. Um, now we're back to being ready for first time applicants. So that might be a farmer who didn't take that loan um, because they didn't know about it or because they didn't think they needed it, whatever that rules or whatever that was. Um, they can go back and, and use the same rules and apply now. We also expanded it to those farmers who um, had negative income, because in addition to having employees, you could use your self-employed income as a wage. Um, and um, for those with less than $100,000 of income, which is the max for any employee, um, 
they were limited to how much of that they could get. So this new law allows uh, farmers only, it's just a, uh, only for agriculture, only for Schedule F sole proprietors too. So farmers who are uh, operating out of a partnership or an S-Corp or a C-Corp cannot use the gross income rule. So it's real important to understand that because it's pretty confusing and, and a lot of, uh, it's confusing even as it's coming through the banks. So a farmer with at least $100,000 of gross income can go in and get the full PPP loan, even if they were, had negative income before or had less than that on their net return. Um, and that's a loan of about $20,833. Okay, so is, is what it calculates out to. Um, they can take that now. And then as soon as they spend that money, they should be potentially eligible to go back for a second draw. So, um, so in addition to the first draw, they authorized a second draw in the same legislation. Okay. Let me talk a little bit about loan forgiveness and how that works. So loan forgiveness, they made that much easier as well. So in the December bill that they passed, they said any loans that are less than $150,000 can have automatic forgiveness. So you still need to keep documentation of how you spent the money, um, but you don't have to send anything in with your application. You just have to certify that you did it. Uh, so that makes life much simpler. Um, and that really covered about 85% of the PPP loans that were issued the first time around. So they took uh, the vast majority of the number of loans out and then left the compliance for the large ones. Okay. Jordan, Mark, any questions you guys have so far? Tina, one of the other programs that we monitored really closely um, was the EIDL program. And initially, those, the PPP program, the EIDL program, um, had a connection and it actually reduced kind of what, if you qualified for EIDL, your initial money would get de deducted from what your PPP loan would be. Talk a little bit about, I mean, it looks like they've changed some of that. Talk a little bit about the way those two programs interact with one another today. Yeah, yeah. so they used to, they, we, we always said that they didn't play well together. Um, and so depending on the timing of it, it, it affected either how much PPP loan you were eligible for or how much forgiveness you were eligible for. Um, so again, in December, they said, forget that. You can have both and don't worry about it. So for loans that were forgiven prior to December, that had a portion that weren't forgiven because there was an, uh, an EIDL advance. Um, what we think is, what we're understanding from SBA is that those loans, that money will automatically get take, sent to the banks so that they can forgive the rest of those loans. Uh, so I don't think anything has to be done there. I think we're just gonna expect um, additional forgiveness to come through. For those who hadn't applied for forgiveness yet, um, it should, the new applications don't have that line on there. Um, and we should have no questions as to how that works. So yeah, another nice um, clarification they gave us. I know one of the things you mentioned was the, the tax, that clarification. That's what you're referring to, Tina, correct? Well, actually there was two tax clarifications. So there was the one with the EIDL and how that was handled, but we also uh, got clarification that when the CARES Act was written, these PPP loans were written to say that this was tax-free money. And we were pretty excited about that until IRS came in and said, um, okay, we can't say that that's not tax-free money, but any expenses that you use to get that forgiven aren't deductible. Well, that's the same as saying it's taxable. And so Congress has told us for months that that was not their intent. Their intent was really to get tax-free money out there. And so in December, they clarified that the PPP loan proceeds are not taxable and the expenses that you use to get forgiven are deductible. So that, that frees that up and, and becomes really the first tax-free money that you get uh, as a business, um, and as long as I can remember. I know one of the things that you had mentioned earlier was about making sure that you, you get that right marked correctly in your books, maybe you address that. Yeah, I think that's really important. And the um, it, same thing goes for the stimulus checks that you received the 1200 per person early and the 600 now that's not taxable income either. So make sure that those don't get put in your government payments so that your tax repair knows uh, that we don't um, need to include that. It needs to be marked separately and, and very clearly in your books. Okay. Any other things that, that farmers have been asking you or that we should be aware of? There'd be good tips for farmers to know right now? Well, I think 
I think I mentioned the second draw loans, but there is a qualification for the second draw loans that's a little different than the first. So one thing we should talk about is, is in order to qualify for a second draw loan, you have to have seen a gross receipts reduction of 25% or more in any quarter. So that's kind of a confusing talk. So what you really need to do is look at 2019's income per calendar quarter. So even if you're a fiscal year uh, tax repair, it's, it's the calendar quarter compared to that same calendar quarter of 2020. And if you see a 25% reduction, that, 20, that 2020 is 25%, at least less than 2019, then you qualify to get an entire PPP based on the whole year, okay? So, um, so there is a caveat and the lenders are gonna need to know that per quarter information. If you don't have um, quarter by quarter records, you can use an annual method, but we're not finding very many farmers whose annual gross receipts in 2020 are 25% of 2019, just because we saw price increases and other things like that. But we are seeing a lot, especially grain producers whose income varies from one quarter to another, where we saw that 25% reduction on a quarter basis. So um, something really important to, to pay attention to there um, and, that, and being qualified for that second draw. So Tina, it's, it's, so it's gross dollars. So, so as a, a grain producer, if I just didn't sell any grain in a particular quarter, then that could trigger. It could. And you know, another thing we're seeing is um, a lot of grain producers got their MFP1 payment in 2000 and the third quarter of 2019, but did not get their CFAP2 payment until the fourth quarter of 20. You know, so something that simple could be the reason why you qualify. So it's it's really hit and miss, um, but we're finding you know a lot of um, producers who qualify. So um, it's important to get the books out and, and get that checked. And you know a lot of computer software programs make that very easy to look at gross receipts per quarter. Um, and so you know that would be the first step. The other thing is if you think you qualify, you need to check with your tax preparer probably uh, because gross receipts is a hard definition. To define, you know, it should be simple, but of course, nothing is simple. Um, but we do think that that includes the net gain on the sale of, of equipment. So that could be another trigger, um, especially where trades are now treated as sales. So if you sold a or traded a combine in 2019, that could be a significant enough gain, and you didn't do that in 20, that might be your trigger. So um, there's there's lots of things like that 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 go into gross receipts, but um, I think, you know, first step is just definitely to check your books and see if you're close. Tina, you, you, I'm gonna walk you back a little bit. You had talked about, you'd mentioned a couple of programs and obviously farmers have seen, you know, MFP two years ago, but now we've had CFAP one, CFAP two. Talk a little bit, I mean, besides just when those payments came in and how it affects the PPP stuff, but talk, we always get a lot of questions as if, um, does does the fact that I received a PPP loan does that impact you know these other programs and now they addition they added new money um, another 2.3 billion dollars for certain folks contract growers and swine producers talk about how all of those programs kind of interact with one another and does qualifying for one limit my my payments for the other and, and that type of thing yeah, that was certainly a fear when PPP first came out was that if you took that, it would disqualify you from whatever came through USDA, which ended up being CFAP. Um, but there is no correlation between those. You can take both of those. Um, the only thing that it might affect is the second drop PPP and, and the timing of those payments. And um, the other question we get a lot is all those other payments are taxable. Again, the PPP not being taxable is a rare exception to the rule that all these other payments, um, including uh, the $12,000 grant that a lot of people got from the state of Nebraska, um, whether that started as a livestock grant or turned into other businesses open, those two are taxable income. Um, so it's hard when you get one piece tax free and, and then the rest you don't, but um, there, there really is no interplay there. So, um, so you can feel free to, to apply for all of these. Tina, maybe uh, maybe talk a little about about the the change as it applies to the employee retention credit. You had mentioned there's some changes there. There are, and you know, when we talked you know last spring, I kind of glassed over the employee retention credit real quick because 
um, there with the CARES Act, it did say that any employer that used the PPP could not do the employer retention credit. And we felt the PPP was going to be a better deal. Um, and, I, and it still is, but the, in December, they authorized us to use both for the same employer as long as they didn't use the same wages to apply for both. Um, and for the most part, we're finding a lot of producers have enough wages, uh, depending again on the timing of the qualifications. But to qualify for the employer retention credit, um, you need a 50% drop in gross re receipts, okay? Um, so same looking at gross receipts test that you're, if you're looking for that for PPP, if you notice there's a 50% reduction, then you definitely wanna to talk to whoever is preparing your 943 form. So this one does have to be employees, um, but what happens in 2020, and it can get pretty complicated, but the credit is 50% of the wages that, they, that you pay in that quarter. So if you qualify, you'll get a credit back for half the wages that you paid in that quarter. And if you qualified in one quarter, you're gonna automatically be qualified the, second, the next quarter. So 50% of the wages in that quarter. And then as long as you stay under 80% of the gross receipts of 2019, you stay qualified each quarter. Um, in 2020, that's a max uh, on 10,000 wages per employee. So it's a $5,000 credit per employee per year. Okay, so uh, again, if you've got several employees, $5,000 at a time starts to add up. They changed it for 21 and extended it and it made it even better. So now in, for the first two quarters of 21, you only need an 80 or a 20% reduction from 2019 and they'll pay 70% of your wages. Okay, so, um, you know, a significant, you know, you've got 10 or 12 employees that are making more than 40,000 a year and that they changed it from 10,000 per year per employee to 10,000 per quarter per employee. So you could get 7,000 per employee per quarter in 21. So um, starts to get to be pretty significant money and allows us actually a planning opportunity because those quarters haven't happened yet. So if we can control our gross income and keep it under 80%, um, then we can qualify for that credit. So again, it's, it's, um, hit and miss as to who, who can control their income and make that happen. But if you can, it's a significant credit. When you talk about <clears throat> it affecting folks, I mean, obviously it's an employee retention credit. I'm a, I'm a, say I'm a farmer. It's just, it's just me. Um, I mean, I, and, and, you know, it would be a structure where, you know, it could be, I, I, it depends upon, you know, how they, how, obviously how they treat their income and their, and their spouse's income maybe, but, um, walk through a little bit of, uh, clarify that a little bit for me if I'm just a producer and maybe depend upon sure how I have my my business set up, but walk through that a little bit. Sure. So if you're a sole proprietor filing on a Schedule F on your 1040, if you don't have any employees, the employee retention credit's not for you, okay? Um, same thing with a partnership. If you're if you're filing in a, a partnership but no, have no employees still out, so they didn't put a self-employed um part into the employee retention credit like they did the PPP. But okay. if you move to the S Corp or the C Corp level, then you become an employee of the corporation and you have qualified wages. I take that, back. so I, there's another caveat. I always forget uh, that the employee retention credit does not work for related parties. So, um, and it's, it's a weird rule. So the definition that they went and pulled does not actually include spouses as a related party, but it does include like nephew-in-laws and nieces-in-law. So it goes way out but it doesn't include your spouse. So your spouse is not related to you for this credit, but your son and your brother are. Um, so we have some rules with that to follow too, so. Okay. I think this kind of, again, as we talk about all this, it always reminds me of our comment that we have to, we tend to make, but it's, you, you mentioned it earlier too, which is always, as you walk through this, things get pretty complex. It's always good to talk to a tax professional just because of how complex all of this can be. And you wanna make sure you're getting the best bang for your buck on this stuff too. That's absolutely true. And uh, you know, think about this is really less than three weeks old. Uh, most of this stuff is, is we're figuring it out as fast as they're putting information out there. So um, be patient with your tax preparers. They learn this stuff too, because uh, with, this wasn't in our tax updates last fall. This wasn't, you know, this is all new stuff that's, um, that's really um, coming at us pretty quick. So Tina, is there a cap on these dollars? I mean, is a first come, first serve kind of thing? 
Yeah, PPP is still going to be first come first serve. And, you know, last time that money went really fast. Um, and it's hard to guess exactly how fast this money is going to go. It's a little bit less than what they dished out in 20 that they appropriated. So we've got that, but they also pulled the rules down. So instead of having 500 employees, you can only have 300 employees. And so uh, those, a lot of those really big loans that went out are not going to be eligible the second time around. So it makes you think that, that um, this money is going to last a little bit longer if the loans that are going out are smaller, but it's hard to know. Um, so, you know, if you can, probably the best bet is earlier rather than later, but again, it's, it's hard to know. And again, you said this is just for sole proprietor on the farmer side. It's not if you farm as a corporation. Right. So that part that, that would qualify you if you to go to, with a gross income test rather than the net income test would only be sole proprietor schedule F. So yeah, lots of, lots of things that got written into that, that made it very complicated, but, um, and really those were the, the corporations really didn't get left out the first round because they had wages because you have to pay yourself a wage. So there was a little bit more inclusion there and it was those sole proprietors that with negative incomes that really, um, and can't pay themselves a wage were the ones that, um, Add a little bit out. I think if anybody's the loser here, it's those who farm in partnerships um, because they're the self-employed individuals, but it it clearly says as an individual and it's pretty hard to, to work around that as much as I've tried to read that differently. I just can't, so. Yeah. Tina, maybe we had talked a little bit earlier, just some general tax issues, a few things. Is there anything else that you'd like to mention or that you think is important? For people to keep you know, um, you know, I think, um, you know, I mentioned that those stimulus checks are not taxable, but your tax preparer will need to know how much you receive because we do have to reconcile that. So it's going to be a question that uh, doesn't seem important, but um, but we need to know. Um, and they did set the filing deadline for February 21st, which is about three weeks later than normal. That means the first uh, returns that we can e-file into IRS can be accepted on the 12th. Um, so we're expecting a little later than normal filing season. Um, as of this point, there's no change to the March 1st deadline. Um, so we need to move forward with that as planned, but I think um, we need to be aware that there, I would guess the potential is there. Um, and you know, there's already rumors and, and rumblings about the April 15th deadline being pushed as well. So um, that doesn't always help our farmers out so much because we've got to get tax returns to banks to our renewals and everybody wants it done before they get in the tractor to start planting and um, those sorts of things. But, you know, something to be aware of and, and watch the news. Well, Tina, I, I want to be cognizant of your time. We, we, we promise we wouldn't keep you all afternoon. Uh, Jordan or Mark, is there any other questions that you guys might have? I think we're good. Thank you a lot, Tina. This is very, very, very helpful. Good. I'm glad I said I've been living and breathing this for a few weeks. So I might as well share what I know. So, <laughs> well, I know we really appreciate it, Tina. Thanks, Jordan. And thanks, Mark, for your time this afternoon. And Tina, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Uh, always want to make sure we give people an opportunity to connect. So uh, maybe Tina, just uh, to close, maybe how can people find you if they're looking to learn more? Yeah, I, the easiest thing is to find our website. It's nfbi.net. And, um, you know, we post articles and things there for, for, um, clients. So it's there and available for anybody if they have more questions. You know, what I know is usually written and up there. So okay. sounds great. And if you okay. want to find more information about Nebraska Farm Bureau, you can certainly find us at nefb.org or follow us on Facebook or on Twitter. Uh, all of our content generally wakes its way there. So thanks again to everybody this afternoon. Appreciate your time. We'll see you next time.